Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us again today for our disruptive leadership series and our webinars. I'm very excited for today. Um, today, our webinar is titled Full Access, Creating a Remote Work Environment for Everyone. And what we've decided to do is put together a panel of content experts that work with this um, every single day. So we're very thrilled to have our panel today. So with us, we have from the Center for Accommodations and Access, we have Lauren Jones McCowan and Caitlin Ballou. And then from our Center for Online Learning at Columbus State University, we have Ann Newland with us. So please, please take advantage of the Q&A function. We do want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, so, you know, whatever questions you might have, go ahead and chat those in and we'll be sure to touch base with them um, throughout the presentation. So with that being said, welcome to Full Access. Off to you, Lauren. Good morning. Thank you, Chelsea. And thank you everyone for joining us on your Thursday, Thursday morning or your almost lunchtime. So a few things just to uh, a self disclaimer. I am an attorney. However, I am only licensed in Massachusetts, and so none of this can be taken as legal advice. So everyone right now is struggling just a little bit with transitioning to essentially an all online life. Um, our work is online, class is online, pretty much everything's online now. So this transition is especially difficult for people with disabilities. And even though businesses will reopen hopefully soon and people will start to have a sense of comfort and some normalcy when it returns, the CARES Act actually does not require people with certain disabilities to return to work until they feel comfortable that they have reduced their risk of possibly contracting COVID-19. So remote working may continue for far longer with people with certain disabilities than, than for everyone else. Um, before this presentation, we did a pre-poll, and in the pre-poll statistics, it reported that 81% of the people who took the poll thought that the number of people with disabilities was lower than 19%. So per the 2010 census, 19% uh, of people in the US have a disability. Um, there are varying statistics from other, other areas, um, but it's a census year, so we thought we'd go with the census statistics. Of those 19, that means that maybe one-fifth of your employees have disabilities, and 19% of your customers could have disabilities. So making sure your business is accessible and inclusive is not only important for your employees and your employee morale, but also it directly impacts your bottom line and your profit mar margins. Today, we're gonna cover some general tips about creating a more accessible workplace, as well as assist assistive technology basics for you. And then we'll go over how to um, develop and review accessible documents, your web presence and media. So one more reason why accessibility is super important is that the number of, pe number of people getting disability related accommodations in college has increased significantly. The statistics from the National Center for Education Statistics reports that in 2017, 19.4% of undergraduate students have disabilities. And in 19, or sorry, 1996, 6% of undergraduate students reported they have disabilities. So that's a pretty hefty climb and only of 21 years. Um, we're expecting that this decrease, or sorry, this increase is because the stigma around disabilities has decreased significantly. Mm. But also we're finding that um, more of your new hires will be looking for accessible components when they are job searching. Um, so we hope that you'll take some of these tips away and employ them in your regular business practices. So for anyone who thought that one in five or 19% was a pretty steep, um, pretty steep statistic, we thought we should explain what a disability is. So under the Americans with Disability Act, which turns 30 in July, fun fact, um, a disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activity of an, of an individual. That's a broad definition. So the ADA does elaborate further and they explain that um, a major life activity includes caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending, speaking, 
breathing, learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, communicating, and working, as well as the operation of ma major bodily functions. Um, some broad um, would include diabetes, infertility, cancer, anxiety, depression, and even alcohol addiction. So how are disabilities handled within the workplace and in education? First by accommodations, but also by accessibility. So accommodations take a bit more of a band-aid approach in remedying or addressing the, the disability and the accommodations needed. Accommodations typically are required by federal and state laws, and there has to be a direct nexus between one individual and their, diag their diagnosed disability as well as the assistance or the devices that they need to be able to perform their essential job functions or to be successful in their academic career. Um, there has to be an interactive process that takes place. The interactive process uh, must be between the organization or the employer and the individual needing that assistance. Everyone's process is a little bit different, so we recommend that you contact your HR department or your Disability Resource Center. Um, here at CSU, that would be the Center for Accommodation and Access. Now, accessibility takes a very different approach to, um, to assisting people with disabilities. Accessibility is more related to one, is not related to one person's disability, but rather addresses everything as a whole. It's far more pro proactive as well. Accessibility um, makes things available for everyone, regardless of, of your disability. And some elements are required by law, but more from a compliance standpoint. And a great example of how accessibility requirements have helped people um, in like a, a trickle down effect would be curb cuts. So curb cuts, I think everyone is familiar with, but just in case it's the ramp on the edge of the sidewalk, that is usually ridged and sometimes painted yellow depending on where you live. And that ramp goes from the sidewalk to usually the street or the parking lot. The, uh, the curb cuts were initially put in place to help people who are wheelchair users so that they could get onto the sidewalk and get into the building on the sidewalk. Um, however, it's come to help a lot of other folks. So people with weak knees or um, weak ankles might have difficulty taking a big step or, or stepping onto the curb. And so using the curb cut that helps them. It also helps um, little kids who insist on doing everything themselves and don't want mom or dad to pick them up and onto the sidewalk. Uh, they can go around and take the ramp and walk up like, like big kids. And then it also helps the store owner who can bring their, their products in on a dolly or a cart from the street or their truck into their store um, instead of having to go jump off the curb and you know hoist all those materials up risking damage. So I like this example because it directly shows how it impacts someone with a disability, but then carries over to everyone else that, that might, be, might be accessing that, that area. Um, and we hope that you'll find that our other tips are, are effective in that way. So some ground rules for online meetings. I think we've all been in tons of Zoom meetings, it feels like. And first and foremost, lay the ground rules. One person talks at a time. It's very elementary, but it's necessary. Um, you may have to take complete control over the meeting in the platform and just mute everyone. But this will help people with autism to avoid being overstimulated, people with hearing impairments because they can't drown out the background noise sometimes, and then people with anxiety who feel like it's a lot to manage. They have concerns over when and how should they chime in and how to be part of the group. Now, if anyone has is worried because they are going to be muted and they feel like they can't participate fully. Um, a lot of uh, platforms have the raise hand function. And then you also have the, um, the chat box on the side. But if you're going to use the chat box, we recommend giving everyone a little bit more time. Not only does this promote thoughtfulness and a more thorough um, and involved conversation, but it also helps people with cognitive processing disorders who might need a few minutes to switch from listening to watching to then typing in their response. It also helps people with learning disabilities who um, might need an extra minute to double check their spelling or see if the words were entered in the right order when they were typing it in. Another tip would be to introduce yourself 
And this is a, helpful for people with visual impairment because they can't see who's speaking when your box on the Brady Bunch-like Zoom platform uh, lights up, indicating that you're the one speaking. And um, it also helps people with hearing impairment because they might not recognize the tenor of your voice. And so just by introducing yourself and saying, hey, this is Lauren, and going off your statement, uh, carries that over for them. In a similar fashion, it helps people with acquired brain injuries, traumatic brain injuries, and memory disorders who might not remember whose voice belongs to whom. Another thing is that helps jog their, jog their memories so that they can associate and remember, oh yeah, that's the person in my working group, that's the person in my classroom right now. And then lastly, and pretty interestingly, um, studies have shown that introducing yourself in this way at the beginning of a, of a meeting helps to connect people. And just by saying your name, it helps to decrease some of the isolation that we're all experiencing and directly impacts people with psychological disabilities, such as depression and anxiety, by just building that little bit of connectedness within your team. Now, full disclosure, I was on a nine o'clock call this morning and I completely forgot to introduce myself. Um, and the minute I, uh, I muted myself after asking my question of the candidate we were interviewing, I had that, oh my gosh, I can't believe you forgot tip two. So we're all works in progress. Just uh, try your best. <laughs> Number three would be to read your slides or your presented material. So reading your slides is an element of universal design and learning or UDL. UDL is uh, comprised of guidelines that develop a optimized learning for all people, regardless of learning style or disability. Um, now you might recall a few slides back when I was going over the definition of disability for the ADA. That was a lot on one slide but I had to read it because there are people on this presentation that can't read my slide. And if they can't access it, they won't know what the material says. So just by reading your slide is important. Number four is to show your captions. And I won't go into detail on this because I believe my colleagues are going to when Caitlin speaks about um, accessible technology and when Anne speaks about uh, videos. But then number five is to send your information in advance. Um, by sending your in information in advance, you allow everyone to be able to review it beforehand as well as to print it. Um, I'm someone like likes to have a tangible copy and so I can mark it up and write on it as I'm, as I'm preparing for whatever I'm walking myself into. It helps people with visual impairment because sometimes it takes a minute to load your screen reader, which in case you don't know what a screen reader is, no worry, Caitlin's going to review that in a minute. But it also helps people with seizure disorders and migraine disorders. Um, studies have shown that reduced screen time can help prolong their productivity. And that's of course important for them to be able to do their jobs and to study. And then lastly, be flexible. Um, give everyone a little bit of time and a little bit of grace. We all have deadlines and we're all working under unusual circumstances. But by showing that little bit of patience and giving people time, it'll go a long way. Um, the time helps people with cognitive processing disorders, mobility disabilities who might need extra time to type things, things up. And then it also helps people with psychological issues who um, might be caught up in some of the anxiety and loneliness that we're feeling and need a minute and then they can come back to the task. But having that time so that they can focus um, will really help you and really help them. And I think I'd like to close with a referencing a, a quote from Mark Cuban, where he's said that how employers treat their employees right now is a strong indicator for their future success. And so that little bit of grace should hopefully go a long way. So, and that I'll kick it back over to Chelsea. Thanks, Lauren. Um, you know, as you were talking about, you know, um, accommodations and accessibility, you know, the one thing that, you know, there were just a lot of common words that kept coming back out, like thoughtfulness, builds community, I think connecting um, and, and, and really in inclusiveness. I mean, this is what we're talking about in, in terms of leadership development, being inclusive leaders. Um, you know, in our previous webinars, we've talked a lot about creating, um, you know, a great virtual team or, you know, how to do this virtually and online. And, you know, a big part of this is just even allowing 
and having a space for everyone to have the ability to engage and thrive in this virtual envi environment. So th thank you, and I appreciate everything that you've said. We do have a question from Mark, um, Lauren, and I'm gonna direct this to you. And Mark says, we are all being asked to return to work next week. We have been told that, the, that those over 65 who have diabetes, heart disease, or lung disease can continue to work remotely, but that's it. Everyone else must return. Are we in compliance with the CARE Act? So again, um, Mark, I'm not your lawyer, so I would consult your legal counsel. However, per the CARE Act does not override the, and I'm gonna butcher the names of the legislation, but the pregnancy, the Federal Pregnancy Act, the ADA, and the Age Discrimination Act, I believe. And so I would suggest that you refer to those. Um, there are certain types of disabilities that will allow that if you have that, you're at greater risk of contracting COVID-19. And as such, your telework should should continue. All right. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so that's all the questions we have right now. And so I think, you know, Caitlin, I'm going to um, switch it over to you. And so she can kind of help us as leaders have some tools in our toolkit to be able to provide um, an, an inclusive environment. So Caitlin, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Chelsea. My name is Caitlin Ballou. I am a program coordinator at the Center of Accommodations and Access at Columbus State. Um, in my job, I work daily with students who have disabilities and my specialization is in assistive technology. I'm pending a ATACP uh, assistive technology certificate at the moment and disability studied focused research in my background, uh, master's background. So jumping in, I'm going to kind of run through some quick, hopefully applicable uh, assistive technologies for everybody right now, considering uh, the things going on with COVID-19. The first thing I'm going to be talking about is screen readers, then spell checkers, then magnifiers, built-in or captioning within video conferences, and then built-in versus third-party applications. So I'm gonna jump on in to screen readers. With screen readers, there are two main types. However, they fundamentally assist with re either rendering text or rendering images as speech or braille output. So they read text to you, uh, said in another way. The two main types are either vision or learning disability, uh, mental health uh, disability related. So. I'm gonna first look at the ones that are vision related. And those do benefit basically um, blind and visually impaired de uh, demographics. So jumping in with JAWS. Uh, JAWS is available on Windows. It's typically paid, though there is a free um, version out right now through the company until June 30th, um, but normally it is paid. Microsoft Narrator and VoiceOver are both built into the respective operating systems, Windows for Microsoft Narrator and VoiceOver for Mac OS and iOS. So they are built in. You could access them today on these devices if you wanted after this uh, presentation. And then NVDA is for Windows. However, it is free. For the other half of screen readers, they benefit those with learning disabilities, ADHD, mental health disabilities, so a huge spectrum of people there as well. The thing with uh, these particular screen readers is that they're focused for people who can see, so the way they present information is a little different between if something needs to be fully read out or if it needs to be read out with um, visual guidance, and these focus much more on the latter. Such benefits are highlighting the spoken sentence structure, they'll have a built-in dictionary and thesaurus, and they allow for manipulation of the text, which can be highlighting, um, copying and pasting into their personal notes, things like that where they can actually grasp the text a lot better, which is why it benefits those who, uh, such as learning disabilities, may have trouble just reading the book in a prose for, or a printed form. Going into uh, examples of 
these uh, learning disabilities, mental health disability screen readers. There's a few options as well, and they're on a lot more devices. The first one is Clara Read, which is available on Windows, Mac OS, Chromebook, iOS, Android, web, so pretty much everything. Um, there's free and paid options for it, and you're welcome to try it out. Uh, the free ones, and then if you like it, you could upgrade to the pay. There's also Kurzweil Firefly. It's available on Windows, Mac OS, web, and it has a specific iPad app, so no Android compatibility with this one. Uh, natively. It is a paid application. They do not have a free option, but there is a trial available. And then for read and write, it's available on Windows and Mac OS and it is paid. I do not believe it has a free trial. So there's different options depending on what is most practical because each of these takes a little bit of a different approach to get to the same solution. So different ones may work in different ways for the individual who needs them and work best with that individual. None of them are inherently better than the others. Going into spell checkers now. Spell checkers are programs that have what they do written on the name, thankfully. Great in this day of really weird terminology at points. They check the spelling and grammar mistakes for people. They can benefit those with learning disabilities, um, those with uh, specific learning disabilities like dyslexia especially come to mind where they don't catch it. It can also benefit those who may have some speech um, or like some uh, visual impairments because they might catch it as well. So examples for that are spell checkers. Um, or examples of spell checkers rather, I'm sorry, is Ginger, which is available on Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android keyboard, and Chrome and Safari browser plugins, and it is free. So you can just go download it right now if you'd like. Grammarly is available on basically every major platform uh, that is active at the moment, and it has free and paid options. So you can try it out and see, and if you want the more robust things, you're, you can pay for it if it benefits you. The next thing I will be speaking about is screen magnifiers. Screen magnifiers do what we would expect a actual magnifier to do, but they do it in the digital uh, environment. So they blow up a section of the screen and it's easier for those with low vision so that they can see something. They might not be able to read something at size 12 font, but they might be able to read it at size 50. Um, as an extreme example. There's a handful of examples of these programs too, uh, two of which are built in, which is nice because that would mean they're already accessible to you today. The first, however, is Zoom Text. It is from Windows and it is paid. Next is Microsoft Magnifier, which is also Windows and it's built into the Windows operating system. And then Zoom Magnifier Hover Text. Apple is a little back and forth on exactly what they name uh, their screen magnifiers because it depends on what it's doing. It, however, one of those three will be on there and they all fundamentally are screen magnifiers in their own way and they work on Mac OS and iOS and they are also built in. Jumping into video captioning here. Video captioning is great because it allows those with hearing impairments, autism, and cognitive, uh, sorry, cognitive disabilities to participate in the conference. These, we're, we're in a conference heavy world at the moment, so keeping awareness that you want everybody to join into that conference as you can. It can be helpful to even have like captions on TV, such as with Netflix. I do that myself where I have I do not have a um, speech impediment or not speech of hearing impediment, but I like watching things with captions on TV because it's just easier for me to grasp the information. So even those outside of this or outside of this um, group benefits in the end, which is something that Anne will be speaking out about a little bit more and uh, Lauren has mentioned as well with universal design. Captions also assist when people are speaking quickly. Um, Lauren speaks a little quickly uh, during her presentations typically, and so if you have captions, it's more easy, easy to uh, connect the dots there. And if you missed a word, you can see it up on the screen. There are 
two main uh, video conference softwares that I've seen being used during this period, and it's either Google Hangouts or Zoom for the most part. Google Hangouts and Zoom are available on basically all platforms, which is great. They're accessible. And but they take a bit of a different approach from each other for captioning, and they both have uh, strengths and weaknesses. So for Google Hangouts, they provide free captions, but they're automated. And this means that the their accuracy may not be the best, but it is something that is instant and it can be available for everybody. Zoom, however, allows you to uh, secure your own independent uh, captioner and you they can just hook directly into the zoom conference where you can have captions going live on the screen that should be significantly more accurate because a live human is typing that in so now we're going to look at the final topic which is built-in versus third-party products they both have their pros, they both have their cons. The major three are the major three areas we're going to be looking at is cost, support, and robustness. So starting with cost, built-in is almost always free. I cannot think of a built-in that isn't. Third party can cost money. It doesn't always, but it typically does. So depending on your budget and your requirements, built-in might sound more appealing at the moment, admittedly. However, jumping into the other two, there's support and robustness. So support, typically third party has a more robust support because that is what they do. They're not maintaining the whole operating system. You're not calling Microsoft to say, hey, screen magnifier doesn't work. And Microsoft's going, well, we have, that's one tool in the 10,000 tools on Windows. We'll get back to you. However, for a dedicated company, this is what they do. So their support's going to be a bit more robust with you and be able to go deeper into issues. However, built in typically has longer periods of actual product support because it's built into the system. So Microsoft is likely to support that product longer than what a third party vendor might be able to uh, financially before needing to release a new version. Finally, there's robustness. Robustness is just what can the app do? And with robustness, third party apps are typically more robust because they're able to be specialized. They're able to focus in on this one area that will benefit employees. However, that can be good and bad because they tend to have more device or platform restrictions that might not be available on a built in application. Built in applications tend to be more available on a wide range of hardware uh, within that ecosystem, but they're less specialized, so they might not be able to do what you need to do. And that is a quick rundown, very quick rundown of some assistive technology that will hopefully help right now. And I want to pass it back to Chelsea. Thank you, Caitlin. And, and yes, I appreciate your expertise and in, in going through those for, for all of us um, to have a little bit more awareness. But I will note too, we will be sending these presentation or the presentation and the slides out after this. So you will again be able to have access to all of the great tools that Caitlin just took us through. Um, Caitlin, uh, we do have a question from Carl, and he is asking, who is responsible for providing screen readers to those who need it? That really depends on the environment. Um, within a business environment, that's a, it's a little out of my area because I typically work in a education setting. I I think HR would be probably your best point to talk to though, um, because they typically handle accommodations as a whole uh, for employees. So that would definitely be my first stop to see what they say. If it's somebody that is already a part of vocational rehab, then you would also want to get in contact with vocational rehab and see if they can assist. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so again, I do appreciate all of the great information and tools that we can have in our tool belt as leaders. And so at this time, I'm going to pass it over to you, Anne, to talk about how to design for everyone. Good morning. I'm Ann Newland. I'm the Accessibility Specialist with the Center of Online Learning, or COOL. I work 
primarily with faculty and staff to help them design accessible course technologies and materials. And uh, Lauren gave a great example of how curb cuts help to create accessible physical spaces. Well, we can also create accessible virtual spaces by designing accessible documents, multimedia, and web pages. Um, accessible virtual technology and communications can be used by everyone to the greatest extent, regardless of their abilities. Um, documenting, uh, designing accessible documents and materials is inclusive. It's going to increase the number of stakeholders who have access to your information and your communication. And that's, uh, we have a variety of stakeholders. Um, those of us uh, who are present today, we might have employees who are participating in a webinar or training. We might have customers who are accessing our website, our uh, recorded videos, or we might have students who are, uh, or potential students for enrollment in colleges and universities. But um, by practicing accessible design, we can increase our potential market by one fourth. Um, and we also by, you know, just a lack of awareness, we might be excluding uh, a quarter of, um, of our market. So it's really something important to be aware of. And I hope to increase your awareness today. There are also federal laws that um, require uh, accessible uh, virtual spaces. We do have a slide on accessible uh, federal laws. Um, I'm not seeing, there we go. Thank you. Um, there are some federal laws that uh, require accessible, accessible virtual spaces, just like we have laws for accessible physical spaces. In uh, our higher ed environment, uh, anything digital or that we share must be accessible. And that also applies in uh, businesses. Anything uh, in your website must be accessible. So you can reduce your risk of receiving a complaint or a lawsuit or a hefty settlement um, by making sure that you follow accessibility guidelines. And WCAG, uh, AA or the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines are the international gold standard for uh, creating accessible websites and they also apply to documents and multimedia. And most settlements um, that come from an accessibility complaint do require Web Content Accessibility Guideline conformance. Uh, the Web Content Accessibility Guideline is guided by the principles of all content and communications being perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust for all of your audience or users, whatever the case might be. So there's some tips that uh, we can provide to you for designing accessible um, documents and multimedia. Whenever you use images uh, in any of your materials, you'll need to add alternative text. Caitlin mentioned that screen readers read aloud um, pick information included in images. Well, that really depends on whether or not we have added alternative text to the images. Alternative text is hidden to most users, such as the image on the slide has alternative text, but we don't see that. Um, and we need to add alternative text to images that uh, are functional, such as images that are hyperlinks. We would need to add the link destination in the alternative text. Um, but images that are meant to convey meaning, uh, those definitely need alternative text that would be describing the purpose the image is used in the context in which it is used. So for example, the image on the right is a picture of George Washington, but what I would put in the alternative text is that um, I would not need to say picture or image. I would just say George Washington, uh, politician, statesman, soldier, uh, first president of the United States. 
And to add alternative text, and for most of your software platforms, you would right click on the image and then select edit all text. This does make that information available to screen readers and uh, as Caitlin already mentioned the benefits of this. Next, we've got um, accessible text. We want to be very intentional when we select the type of font and the font size for our materials. Uh, it's best to choose a sans serif font such as Helvetica, Arial, or Calibri. And you want to avoid italics. Those can be very difficult for some people to read. Uh, be mindful of your font size. We want to use uh, text that's at least 12 points for documents and websites, and then that has at least 28 points for slide text and 44 points for slide titles. And we have followed that in this presentation, which I hope you're finding easy to read. Um, then we want to be mindful to left align our text. Text that is center aligned or justified can be very difficult for some people to read because there are some, uh, a, a lot of uh, white space, sort of like rivers of white space that can be very distracting. And be mindful if you are conveying meaning uh, with color alone because some of our users cannot perceive color. So the last bullet point on this slide states important avoid color alone for meaning. It is in red font. If um, you are not able to perceive that red font because of color blindness or low vision, I've also added the word important to draw attention to that same um, section of text. Uh, then next, other considerations related to color. We want to be mindful when we're selecting the colors that are used in our presentations, websites, documents, etc. We can see on this slide we have a variety of good color contrast. We've got light text on a dark background in the slide title, which is color contrast. That's e easy for it's, that really does fall under the web content accessibility guidelines of having at least a 4.1. 4.5 to 1 ratio between the text color and the background color. The black text on a white background provides a 21 to 1 contrast ratio. And then we can see on the right hand side, this is actually a screenshot of the WebAIM contrast checker, which is a very easy to use tool. Uh, where we can input our foreground color or text color and background color and get a reading of whether or not it passes the web content accessibility guidelines. You can see in those text boxes a darker blue, that's sort of a medium um, blue with a black text, also provides an accessible color contrast ratio of 12 to 1. So be mindful when choosing your colors. Next, we're going to go on to um, making sure we use accessible slide titles or headings. This is a critical thing that a lot of people don't really consider when they're designing their documents and presentations. Those slide titles and headings uh, can form an outline that screen reader or text reader users can use to jump right to the content that they need. They really form a clickable outline. So we do want to make sure that for each one of our slides, we have a unique slide title. If slides are used more than once, we want to vary the second title a little bit. If we have a long document, such as what we can see on the right, and we want to create document sections, provide headings for those, and then style those with our software so that they have different heading levels. The title, Accessible Documents and Multimedia, is an H1 heading. The sections below that, such as Accessible Images, Accessible Text, etc., those are H2 level headings. And subsections under the H2 headings would be H3. That provides a nice document structure and actually helps users navigate by those slide um, headings. So that's a critical thing. 
Then we also want to consider accessible media. Caitlin did a great job of uh, discussing the benefits of having accessible live captions when we have presentations. We also need to consider having closed captions for recorded video and audio. There's a uh, many accessible accessibility related lawsuits originated from a complaint that recorded videos on websites did not have closed captions. So we want to be very mindful to include those closed captions. Um, accurate closed captions include correct sentence structure, correct spelling, and their time sync to the video. We have many uh, platforms that will auto generate captions for us, but they are not accurate enough to be considered accessible for recorded video. So we need to be mindful to edit our closed captions for recorded video. Most video platforms provide users with tools for creating um, or editing their captions, such as YouTube um, and many others. I know we're probably all aware of great closed captions and also um, very um, poorly created auto generated captions. So be mindful to have your videos captioned. They're really helpful in many uh, situations, especially when the speaker has an accent. So I just wanted to draw attention to that. If you have audio recordings, uh, a transcript that has been generated from the captions is sufficient for uh, conformance. And so we do want to go on to uh, some tools we can use to evaluate the accessibility of our materials. We want to be mindful and consider accessible design. And I did just touch on five of the main essential features that you need to add to your materials, but there are others. Um, we want to be mindful when we're designing, but we can also check our materials either as we're designing or when we're finished and go back and, and adjust some things, uh, remediate or revise our, our documents for accessibility, just like most of us run a spell check um, with our software tools when we're done with a presentation or a document, you can also easily check the accessibility. And there are document checkers, uh, accessibility checkers worked into many of our platforms, such as Microsoft Office has check accessibility tools. Uh, there's a great add-on that I'd love to use uh, that you can add to your web browser called Grackle Docs. And you can use that to check the accessibility of your Google Docs, Slides, Google Sheets, etc. Uh, most learning management systems, um, our local learning management system at Columbus State, and content management systems that you might use to, to design your website, also have accessibility checkers. Uh, there's a couple of really good uh, accessibility evaluation tools for external sites, such as the WebAIM WAVE Web Accessibility Evaluation Tool can be used to check the accessibility of your website, but also websites that you might use. So that's a great and easy to use tool. And then we did see a screenshot of the WebAIM Contrast Checker. Uh, we've got links for all of those in the chat. Um, thanks to the Leadership Institute. And uh, we, we really do want to encourage you to design accessible documents. Now, there's additional resources, as I mentioned. Um, we've got that indicated on another slide, I believe. Um, oh, okay. Well, some of those resources were uh, in the chat, as I mentioned. We've got uh, WebAIM, we've got CAST, uh, Lauren mentioned Universal Design for Learning, and CAST has great research resources on that. And then there's a, another um, list of resources in the chat. And please, I think my email address is available to you all. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have questions about uh, accessible design of your documents or multimedia. And thanks again. 
Thank you, Anne. Um, and so I think this is just really important as we think about this. I think, you know, Lauren started us off talking today about how, you know, we've had to be really reactive um, since COVID and, and what's been going on. You know, you see clearly we're, we're all in our homes still um, and we don't know when that's going to change. So, you know, I, the way that I love to look at this is as leaders, how we can be inclusive, but also be proactive in making sure that you know, our, our employees, our students, our, our co-workers do have the ability to be fully engaged, um, you know, during this time and during this process of, you know, everything that we're going through. So we do have um, a couple questions and one of them is about general anxiety, excuse me. So what do you suggest for general anxiety or other undiagnosed issues that we are all going to feel planning to return to our workplaces? That Yeah, this is something that we all really need to think about. And a lot of us will probably be feeling this anxiety when we have to adjust again, right? Because that's what it's going to be. We're going to have to adjust again. Um, and so transparency and, and um, you know, being open are clearly givens. Um, but, you know, that, that communication with your team and letting them know where you are. Um, I would also like to reference you to our Facebook page. We have our post um, or previously recorded webinars on the Facebook page. And there is a fantastic one that talks about managing stress and anxiety by Dr. Kelly Baez. Um, so please, please check that one out. I think that would be another great resource just to help kind of follow through with that question. Um, let's see, we do have another one. This is from Lori. Since the pandemic, our institution has, has seen an increase in students seeking accommodations. Have you seen this as well? What do you attribute to this increase? I suppose I can answer that. And then Caitlin, I don't, since you actually work more directly with the students, you might have a different perspective. But we have seen um, we have seen a few more students coming to us asking for accommodations. We've also seen students coming to us asking to change their plans, their accommodation plans. Um, and so, yes, we're seeing that as well. We sympathize, Laurie. Uh, what do we attribute this to? The just the changing in the and what and how they're learning. Uh, switching from face to face to online is difficult, um, especially under the stress and pressure that we're all experiencing right now. And I, I, that's what I attribute, to, attribute it to. Caitlin, do you have a different perspective? Um, this is Caitlin, and I think what Lauren just said is completely accurate. And I would like to add on that it's also a different way of learning than a lot of students are accustomed to. And because it's a different way of learning, they don't really have strategies necessarily and how the accommodations play out may be different. Um, a student who has trouble taking notes in a history class that's in person might face a different difficulty than when they're sitting at, uh, at home right now trying to access a digital lecture and having trouble understanding the professor because the professor is talking too fast in the lecture. So you kind of have to adjust for what the student's experiencing right now, given that there's such a hot, much higher technological focus than many students have probably encountered going through college at the moment. Um, Kaylin, as you were talking and answering that, I couldn't help, but yes, it was directed towards students, but just, you know, empathizing with that too and saying, you know, probably that's a, the same place where a lot of your employees might be, where a lot of your coworkers might be, where we've all had to try to figure out um, how to work virtually, 100% um, remotely when many of us have never done that before. Um, so I couldn't help but think about, you know, um, employees and customers going through those same type of changes too, just like our students at the university. Thank you. Um, one more question. This is from Lisa. So how do I know if I'm meeting the needs of employees who have unseen disabilities when I'm not allowed to ask about unseen disabilities? So I think maybe I could take that one. Um, so Lisa, you're totally correct. You can't ask if someone has a disability like that. Um, that would be an inappropriate conversation. But I would suggest that you actually embrace some of the tenets of servant leadership in developing a 
a trusting and inclusive environment within your office um, and asking what you can do for your employees that day or your staff members, how you can be of service to them. I know that's one of the things that the Leadership Institute and Servant Leadership Department always promote is how can you be of service to others and how and how can you help them? And the reality is they might never tell you um, whether or not they have a disability. They might eventually feel comfortable open, opening up and sharing that. But even if, even if they don't tell you, which of course they don't have to, um, if they were to at least answer your questions and say, well, what you could do to help me is one, two, three. You're then you're then filling that void or helping them in that way, which maybe you're perceiving as a as a disability. So, thank you, Lauren. I think that's just, I mean, the servant leadership component of this would be, uh, you know, definitely something to keep in mind. And um, you know, as we are continuing to work from home. Um, and still continuing to figure this out. Uh, you know, I was talking with my boss yesterday. It's a day by day basis, right? Um, and really just making sure that you are meeting the needs of others and having those open conversations and that transparency. Um, I've been reading, trying to trying to work through a book called The Culture Code. And one of the things, um, the skill set number one to have an engaging culture is to create safety um, and providing that environment where we feel comfortable having these tough or awkward conversations. So I appreciate that answer, Lauren. Um, well, that really wraps us up at this point in time. Um, any questions that we have not been able to answer, we will follow up with you. These slides will be available within 48 hours. Um, we will email them to you, so please put your email um, in the Q&A if you would like if you would like a follow up and we would also we will also have the recording available as well. So we appreciate your time today. If you could please take a minute and give us some feedback. Um, you know, this is the first time we're trying a panel. So again, we're putting ourselves out there. We're trying something new and we'd love to see your or hear your thoughts on on how it went and what we can do better or really too, what topics you would like to see in the future. Um, we're, we've realized that we will probably still be at home for a little bit while longer. So what can we do? What can we put out there to help you during this time? And we'll do our very best to make sure that we, we get that for you. Um, with that being said, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and please, you know, make sure that you are creating a full access um, and your employees have full access to being engaged as possible. Thank you.